Hello and welcome to Luxology's SIGGRAPH 2008 presentation. Uh, I'm Brad Peebler, president of Luxology. I'm very excited to be with you here today to share some exciting news and a sneak peek at some advanced technologies. Uh, first, I want to review with you our core mission. Uh, for those of you who are not as familiar with Luxology, our core goal has always been to create and maintain the market's most modern application architecture. This is an architecture we refer to as Nexus. Nexus is a highly layered, cross-platform, generalized, time-aware architecture for rapid development of media applications. It's a mouthful. Uh, for those of you who think of us as the Moto company, you may be saying, hey, what is this Nexus thing? Well, Nexus is actually where we put all of our effort. And Moto is essentially a child of Nexus. It's born from within the Nexus framework. Uh, Nexus allows us a very powerful way to build media applications. It allows us to fully leverage multi-core CPU and GPU. Um, and to share the power of both of those in a way that can advance ergonomics, not just the hardcore algorithms. Now, before we go too far down the line here, I do want to give a quick note of thanks to our SIGGRAPH 2008 partners. That would be, of course, Deso Systems SolidWorks and our good friends over at Bentley. We do find more and more of our customers using Moto to visualize CAD data. And so we've made some interesting improvements into the Nexus 4 architecture to enable a more smooth data flow between the applications. Uh, there's a lot more to reveal on this topic, but we'll get back to that. Right now I want to show you something. I want to take a look at the power of Nexus today. Now, as I mentioned, we're not just uh, writing technology for technology's sake. Uh, I want to show you a demonstration here that illustrates why it's important to fully leverage the CPU and GPU, but l also apply an eye towards advanced ergonomics. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with some heavy data. Uh, as many of you know, CAD data can be very expensive, almost pathological. So I'm loading a file here. This is a SolidWorks assembly directly into the Nexus 4 architecture. Uh, this is a UI that I quickly mocked up. Uh, just to show some specific workflows inside of Nexus. And rather than reinventing the wheel, we just use some very standard uh, UIs for applying materials. This is just drag and drop or copy and paste. Um, if you've ever worked with CAD data, you know that um, if you're not familiar with the data set, sometimes a model can be broken down in ways that you're unfamiliar with. Well, we find the best way to apply materials in a situation like that is visually rather than trying to wade through a long list of materials and figure out what the artist or engineer had named things we just drag and drop if it doesn't apply where we thought it would copy paste and leveraging the incredibly high speed rendering technology uh, to give us immediate feedback means that we can very quickly suss out where things are applied correctly where they're incorrect and then just copy and paste between them so it's so quick and easy to do um, with that workflow that it's very easy to very quickly uh, create a completely textured model. Here you can see we're even applying more advanced materials such as a true physically based glass material. Uh, here's another glass material that uses Beer's Law to attenuate the rays according to the thickness of the material that it's traveling through. We've got lots of different uh, chrome and metal presets and again just find the one visually that uh, most is most applicable to your project, choose it, drag it, drop it, and see the results immediately. Um, not having to spend even 30 seconds or a minute on a test render to get the final result uh, means that you can iterate much more quickly. You can really experiment, not just with different materials, but also with, with different environments. Here we're just double clicking on different environment presets and having those applied to the scene so we can get a feel for different lighting scenarios, including an underlit lighting studio. Uh, let's go back here to one that's a bit more dramatic lighting and we're just going to do some quick tweaks. Again, this is just a quick UI we put together using the uh, very malleable Nexus UI framework. And you can see we're just dragging the gamma down here interactively. And what I want is that bright hot spot to just perfectly frame the car. So by default I'm navigating the camera so we just need to spin the environment around a little bit. So let's grab that little slider there slide it right around and again uh, with that speed and feedback of the render engine of course having high speed render engine is great for final images but being able to work directly inside that viewport uh, with CAD data with advanced materials physically based shading on many of these surfaces and an environment of course um, gets us to final image faster than ever before and this 
um, is what we consider the real power of the Nexus architecture, leveraging the ability to scale with uh, CAD type data, uh, having incredibly fast feedback, and applying all this advanced technology towards ergonomics rather than just showy new features. Now, I also should mention that last year we announced a technology transfer with Pixar. Some of the presentations you're going to see uh, today with regard to rendering are direct advancements that we have made over the last year as, uh, as a result of that transfer. So we're very excited about that. And I should also note at this time, uh, we're showing everything today inside of the Nexus 4 framework. But keep in mind, if you use Moto, everything that we do inside of Nexus eventually makes its way into the Moto product. So everything we're doing today in Nexus 4 will be in the next major release of Moto. So let's just take a quick look at the update on our mission. Create and maintain the market's most modern application architecture. We continue to push the envelope and we believe we still maintain that position. Uh, our second bullet here is to provide innovative ergonomics within a next generation 3D content creation tool. In other words, stress test the Nexus architecture in a commercial product. And that of course is what we refer to as Modo. Uh, Moto has been on the market now for about five years, and uh, it has done a great job of getting out there. Uh, one way to test if your advanced ergonomics are working is to take a look at the throughput and the reach of the product. So here we can see um, Moto has been very successful in film and broadcast, in um, visual effects, also of course in game development. Uh, we find a lot of people using Moto for character design. We find a lot of people using Moto for things like computer graphics of advertising and marketing, industrial design, web and print graphics, biomedical imaging. Of course, enthusiasts are also a large section of our community and architectural engineering construction. There are a lot of different uh, markets. I didn't actually mention uh, jewelry design. We find a lot of people using it for that. Um, but what's interesting about this particular slide is the number of images and the quality at which uh, these images are presented. So if you go to luxology.com slash gallery, you will find literally thousands of high quality images that have been submitted by our committee, community. Now admittedly, our community is actually quite a bit smaller than some of the applications that have been around for 20 years plus. Yet our community seems to be far more prolific. Uh, aside from us believing we just have better artists, we also think that this is a real testament to the power of advanced ergonomics. The fact that we have not only just answered the question, can you do a specific thing, we have been addressing the question of how quickly can you accomplish that process. And so really focusing on cutting down the number of clicks, improving the rendering workflow to allow artists to, to iterate more quickly, has allowed us to unleash the creative flow of the artists, which in turn has generated a tremendous amount of work from the Moto community. So in terms of providing innovative ergonomics within a next generation 3D content creation tool, absolutely, we believe we have achieved that goal with Moto. Now the next goal is to extend the reach of Luxology technology to grow the pie. Uh, we're not here strictly to drink someone else's milkshake as it were. Um, before SIGGRAPH this year, I asked our sales department to put together a short list of some of our top end clients. And I was shocked to find uh, that list just goes on and on and on. Uh, it's been really very validating to find uh, such a broad base uh, install for Moto to see all these people that are using the application. Um, this is one of the reasons we got into the business is that we are inspired by artist creations. And so the more people using our technology, the more exciting it is for us. Of course, the more feedback we get and the more we can improve our technology. And this is that aspect of reach. We really want to reach a lot of people. We really want to impact people's lives in a positive way. And one strategy to achieve that goal is to sell many, many Moto or M Modi. Not sure what plural of Moto is. It's probably just Moto. But there's another component to our strategy. And this is one we haven't spoken about a lot. Uh, up until now, and that is to leverage the Nexus architecture to provide technology partners with custom applications and or component technologies for integration into host applications. In other words, we felt like we could extend our reach by creating this Nexus framework that not only allowed us to deliver a product on the market, but also allowed technology partners 
to leverage that Nexus framework, either carve out a specific application or layer out some technologies that they could integrate. And I have to say, this is, a, of course, a completely new arm of the business. And if you were starting a new business unit, uh, let's say we decided to do fabric uh, creation. We want to create a, a textiles division. And our first client was Dol Dolce & Gabbana. Well, we would be ecstatic. You'd fall over backwards. You'd pass out, probably. Well, that's a bit the way we felt when, when we're rolling out our first technology licensing partner. And of course, as you probably are already aware, our first technology licensing partner is none other than Dassault Systems SolidWorks. These guys and gals, guys and girls, ladies and men, ladies and gentlemen, uh, SolidWorks is the global leader in mechanical engineering CAD software. These people are phenomenal. Huge install base. Um, so we were so very happy when they came to us to have us build a custom application for them for SolidWorks 2009 based on the Nexus framework. Uh, there will be more specific information about that product coming soon, but we think it's a very exciting offering. Our second technology license partner, of course, Bentley. These guys are global giants in the world of architectural engineering construction and geospatial engineering. Again, a user base with hundreds of thousands of customers. Um, both of these companies are literally industry giants in the CAD world. And it is so exciting, uh, in many ways very humbling for us to have them as our number one and number two technology license partners. Number one and number two in time, of course. Uh, they're both equal partners to us. Uh, now, one thing that's great about both these companies is they know a lot about scale. And in some ways, that uh, amount of scale is a little bit intimidating. So when we first started talking to Bentley in particular, uh, Ray Bentley, one of the founders over there, wanted us to convince him that the Nexus framework could scale in such a way that would be necessary for their product MicroStation. Now keep in mind, MicroStation is used to design and build literally um, roads, bridges, and highways for the Department of Transportation. Uh, the water cube at this year's Beijing Olympics designed in MicroStation. So these structures um, are a phenomenal amount of detail and density. So Ray wanted me to convince him that our render engine could handle their data set. So I went off and, uh, of course, in the entertainment sector, we think of density, um, high density models in terms of uh, sculpting. That's one good way to get a lot of polygons. So I went to my friend Andy Brown and I got his Pablo Picasso model, uh, which at render time is a couple million polygons. And I wanted to show Ray something more than a couple million. So I quickly put together this scene using a new de um, geometry compression technique called replicators. And each one of these busts is two million polygons, roughly, give or take. And what you'll notice if we zoom in here, the total poly count is 1,131.1 billion polygons. That's also 1.131 trillion polygons. You notice all those little dots in the background there, those are all little tiny Pablos in the scene. So yes, we can absolutely scale to millions, billions, even trillions of polygons in a final rendered image. Now, it's easy enough to show an image, a single image, but let me show you directly the effects of this scale. Here we have um, the standard rhinoceros. I've added a displacement texture to him and you can see at render time here this guy is about 1.5 give or take million polygons. 1.47 I'm rounding up. Now if I activate the replicator item you see that I've created a, an entire herd varied in uh, rotation, position, and scale. Notice the poly count now 1.6 billion polygons with global illumination. Micro displacement rendered on eight cores in about 12.1 seconds. Again, final rendered, very easy to scale uh, with multi-cores, but interactive a little bit more difficult. Check this out. Here's our preview viewport, and now I'm actually navigating the camera amongst that herd of rhinoceri, rhinoceroses, having problems with plurals today. We can zoom around, look at any of these replicants. Uh, again, this is the power of multi-core this is the power of fully leveraging the machine. This is the power of really understanding what it takes to write well-threaded interactive code directly connected to one of the fastest global illumination rendering models in the world. Again, just navigating around fully interactively 
at near HD resolutions while we're screen cap. That's pretty cool stuff. That is another great example of how we can scale not only at final render, but also interactively. Now something else that's come up a lot of times when talking to the Moto community and also when talking to our talk technology partners is that of the addition of some atmosphere. People would like to have a bit more atmosphere in their scenes and for the visual effects world, the fantasy lovers, how about one of these guys? I had to whip this, guy, this image up. This is actually a model created by Alex Pavlovich. Um, I, I created this image because I want to have it silk screened on my van. Uh, thanks for the idea by Jason Linhart. I think that would look great on the side of my 70s rockin' van. Uh, a little bit more traditional use of atmospherics. These are, of course, volumetric lights for architectural visualization. Again, we can implement these things inside of Nexus such that not only will our technology license partners benefit from them, but our Moto customers will benefit from them. And that is why we built Nexus, so that we could service multiple clients, be it technology license partners or direct software sales clients uh, with the same technologies. And these technologies are integrated in such a way that they, they work with all the other features. Here you can see casting shadows through complex cloned objects. Here we can see it's directly modulated by different procedural textures. Um, the volumetric light is just another attribute on a light item in the shader tree and so any image or procedural or gradient can be used to modulate it for far out effects or very soft and subtle effects here. You can see this volumetric lights playing off of the object using subsurface scattering, image-based displacement. Uh, this is the subject of Andy Brown's seahorse tutorial, which is modeled, sculpted, UV mapped, painted, and rendered directly inside of Moto. And now you'll be able to apply beautiful volumetric effects as well. And another thing that um, we get requests for a lot is adding organic detail and this comes from our moto community and it comes from our technology license partners you can imagine if you are uh, Bentley microstation and you want to do architectural renderings you probably want something like grass so rather than just implement a strict grass functionality uh, we of course have the mentality of a more generalized approach to development so we knew our moto customers were interested in fur and hair and we knew that our architectural visualization customers, whether they're at Moto, uh, whether they're using Moto or using uh, MicroStation, were interested in grass. So we've created a fur material, and I'm finger quoting fur, uh, that is flexible enough to achieve many different looks. Here we can see it in grass. Here we can see the interior of my van, the shag carpet, pretty sweet. Here you can see very short fur used for a nice towel. Of course, fur can be used for, you guessed it, fur. Uh, not just straight fur, we also have various controls such as curling and clumping. You can change the growth randomization uh, to create very wild looking effects. We can of course texture the fur. So here we can see an image texture applied to the diffuse color or a gradient applied to the diffuse color. and just like volumetric lights, the fur material is direct inside the shader tree, so any texture or gradient can be used to drive any of the parameters of the fur, such as the shape or combing direction. And of course, it integrates directly with vector displacement. Here you can see the earth that's been uh, sculpted, and then some nice grass applied on the high points of the displacement. Gradients can also drive along the particle length or along the length of the fur. Here you can see an anemone, purple at the base and then reaching yellower at the tips. And we can also take practical effects and make them sexy. Here we can see a nice toothbrush bristle. And notice again the integration. Uh, this is not a post process. This is not some sort of pixel filter. This is a real uh, rendered component integrated at the heart of the rendering system. So here it's integrating with the transparency that's casting the blue cast on the ground. You see refraction of the bristles inside the brush. Um, just gorgeous, gorgeous effects. And of course, as I mentioned, as being part of the shader tree, we can even use luminous materials. This is a luminous material on a gradient driven by the length of the fur to create a cool fiber optics effect. And all the light in that scene is coming directly from the fur material. There are no direct lights, no other 3D light sources, no 
luminous materials other than the fur. And even for very soft and subtle effects, this is actually a combination of two technologies. You're seeing the replicators, the same technology we used for the rhinoceros herd, um, creating the little stalks, and then the fur is rendered at the tip. So we just create one single um, dandelion strand and then replicate that around the surface of the sphere to create the full dandelion. Some pretty cool stuff. And again, images go a long way to show you the power and flexibility, but what I want to show you is a quick demonstration to illustrate the importance of integration of these technologies and the generality of implementation. Here we can see that I'm actually navigating inside the preview. Notice that you can actually see the volumetric shadows being cast interactively as we move around. So we've got um, thousands of grass fibers in the scene. I can change the uh, parameters of the grass, make it more uh, randomized. We can, of course, increase dramatically the number of segments, add some curl, and again, fully interactive inside of our advanced preview rendering viewport, which deeply leverages the multi-core, also leveraging the GPU here. Again, as I'm tweaking the parameters on the grass, rather than just seeing a GL proxy, which of course you can do, I can see the effects directly inside the final rendered image with the preview. So I'm just changing the density here, again rolling around. Now we're outside the volume of the light, just to illustrate the shadows, the soft effects of the light, I'm going to tweak back to the original hairs, or fur, the grass, and get back to a little bit more dense. Now, in terms of uh, the GL representation, you can see that we, of course, do see that directly in GL. And one thing that's really nice is that this also integrates directly with our sculpting tool. So to comb it, you can actually go in and create a vector map to drive the fur. And so now I can push to expand it. And essentially, all of your sculpting workflows uh, are applied here. Control will go reverse of the tool. Here I'm using the fold tool to create little strips of fur or to and using the control key to kind of push them down, tangent pinch to comb them inward. So you don't have to learn an entirely new combing system. All the tools that you've used with sculpting inside of 301 will now be applicable for combing, fur, grass, hair, whatnot. Again, we can use inflate to just pump that up, increase or decrease the effect along the initial vector. It's a very, very powerful way to work and a very simple one because of the generality of implementation. And of course, you can quickly switch between your maps or the geometry, so we can sculpt the ground plane and you can see that the grass follows perfectly along as we deform the mesh. And then just pop back over to image mode, use a little smooth, change that. Again, a little center pinch so we can kind of pull these strands together, create some clumps. So you can either manually clump them or you can use the clumping parameter directly on the fur material. Some very, very powerful way to work here inside of the Nexus 4 architecture. And again, everything we do inside of Nexus is going to hit Moto. All right. Now, there's another demo I want to give you here. Actually, it's not a demo. Some images I want to show you. Um, just before I, had, I went down to SIGGRAPH, I got some images from one of our beta testers. And I didn't plan to show these off, but I just thought they were sexy enough that, what the heck, I know you guys like to see uh, new goodies. so. Here's what we're going to do. Here's a, uh, a very simple metal material with um, blurry reflections on. Uh, now here is a new type of map. And this is called an anisotropic texture. And what it does is it drives anisotropy direction based on U or V um, directions based on the red or blue component of the image. So if you take this image or this material and you add that texture, you get this result. So this new anisotropic texture allows us to create really nice carbon fiber, fibers or brushed metals. Uh, you can see here a great example, the carbon fiber on the shoe, the brushed aluminum on the pedestal. Just some really gorgeous effects that you can achieve with this new anisotropic texture. There's another thing we find a lot of Moto users doing. A lot of, uh, I believe in the not so distant future, a lot of uh, SOLIDWORKS users uh, leveraging our rendering and also, of course, uh, MicroStation users. And they'll be rendering metals. And one thing that's important to metal is what's called a clear coat, uh, or particularly painted metals. Here you can see a nice blurry reflection material. This is the base coat. Now watch what happens when we add clear coat. Gorgeous. 
Notice how it really pulls that material out. This is uh, simulating the lacquered effect clear coat on the material there. And then, of course, here it is integrated into the final shot. Again, another shot before clear coat. Now, in Moto 302, or 30, yes, 302, you can actually do this now by adding multiple shaders. But here, we just drive up one parameter, and boom, clear coat, and final image. You can really create some gorgeous painted effects with this new shader. It's actually not even a shader, new shader parameter. One parameter on the material item, and it can be textured, of course, as well. Now, for those of you out there in Moto Land who are um, strictly modelers, you might say, hey, uh, what about us? Well, of course, uh, what we've been illustrating today in terms of new functionalities and new technologies are highly driven by our technology license announcements. Since we have these two very exciting new partnerships, we wanted to show some of the advancements we've made inside of Nexus 4 that will benefit and facilitate those agreements. However, we wanted to show it in the context of, hey, these are also directly applicable to Moto. The rendering, the advanced preview, the grass, the volumetrics, all things that benefit our technology partners but also directly benefit the Moto community. Well, of course, for those of you who like to model, we also like to model and we never stop pushing the envelope there. Uh, we've added a lot of new functionality in the area of modeling. I want to focus today a little bit of uh, topology modeling. So I had Andy Brown, our good friend Andy, pull this video together. One of the ways that we actually um, steer the development of Moto, and in particular the modeling tools, is we have Andy make training videos, and then we watch him do things, and when he does something that we find embarrassing, we fix it. And Andy does a lot of topology recreation, where he sculpts high-density meshes and then rebuilds the mesh over. And this is a common workflow, not only in the entertainment space for sculpted data, but also in the CAD world. So we wanted to really improve that workflow. Here are the pen tool. You saw it initially working in wall mode to create a quick strip. Now we're also using it in uh, use existing points mode. So he can just start to click down single vertices and new quad polys are created attached to the original topology. No merging required. It's just directly fit in there. We're also using a new advanced background constraint. And here we're going to use an edge grow command. Uh, along with the constraint. So notice as he's added these new edge or new quads rather, they're constrained perfectly to the background geometry. No tweaking required. It just popped them right on there. Um, another thing that you also often find yourself doing is having to close in gaps. Here's a fill quads that will not only create new polygons but create quadrangular polygons. And what we're going to do here is further illustrate the power of this new background constraint. There are two new modes. One is screen axis and one is vector. This is screen axis and we're setting the rotation transform to origin. Notice as we rotate the mesh in the foreground, it is perfectly constrained to the geometry that's inactive, the background geometry. So any of the transform tools now will work with this new constrained methodology. And just that little component alone um, creates a vast array of tools that you can work with in a topology workflow. Again, because of our approach to development, which emphasizes generality, this background constraint is directly integrated inside of the tool pipe. So all transforms work, even things that you wouldn't expect, like the bend transform now supports the vector axis constraint. So you see as the vertices are moving along their vectors, it's constrained to the background. Very powerful stuff, allowing to slide the model around. Now here's another illustration of the wall tool. We showed you the pen tool earlier in wall mode for topology, but you might have guessed that the wall mode was actually designed for making walls. It has an inner mode, an outer mode, and a both sides. Of course, we can just close this. You can set your own thickness. Uh, and of course, you can drive the inset amount, which creates some nice rounded edges. And then we can just hop over here into the perspective view and extrude that out. So again, most of what we've been illustrating today is focused on hardcore advanced technologies, but one of the things that really makes Moto Moto, aside being a great modeler, is the attention to little details. So we wanted to show you that that has not stopped. Uh, while we continue to drive advancements of major systems in the Nexus framework, we also continue to focus on the little details that makes Moto Moto and what brings the joy back to modeling for so many people. So, in summary, it's been a busy year. 
Uh, we believe that we have maintained our lead in next generation technology by pushing the envelope with Nexus. You've seen a few examples of that from the massively enhanced preview rendering, replicators, um, the ability to import some new CAD data directly. You saw us bringing in SolidWorks files directly into the Nexus framework. Of course, we continue our position as an ergonomics innovator with our Moto product, continuing to refine workflows. You saw some examples of that in the topology modeling demonstration. And to enter the technology licensing business with a bang. We are so excited to have two of the largest CAD software companies in the world as our first two technology licensing partners. From Deso Systems SolidWorks to Bentley, uh, these are certainly very exciting times for Luxology. And we think that you are, we hope we, you will agree, uh, if you're a Moto customer, that this is also incredibly beneficial to you. Because as we grow our business, as we advance the technology of Nexus, we implicitly advance the feature set and the scope and the reach of the Moto product line. Thank you and have a great week.